it's um, it's a very sad state of affairs. I mean, academia is essentially cashing in on people's desire for a, a, a reliable and well-paid job. I guess the other aspect from your point of view is I've heard that there's, there's a, so there are loads and loads of green graduate chemical engineers. Uh, what there are not are people, are sort of new pipers. I've, I've heard that the sort of the traditional route into piping engineering, uh, sort of on, on the on the drawing board or the modern equivalent of that, is, is more or less gone. There's no nobody who has a sort of apprenticeship working through producing ISOs and and, and building that up from um, based on transmission of knowledge from from more experienced uh, engineers. I, I'm not even sure now how how people get into piping. Yeah, I, I think the on-ramps in the developed world are all gone. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's like uh, it's like Hollywood. Uh, you're either a star or you're not, you know, you're washing cars and waiting tables. You know, I mean, I, I there's no on-ramp. There's no uh, mentoring program. It's all it's all gone to the third world. And even there. Uh, the third world has a problem because they, they uh, as a designer, they recruit engineers and then the engineers end up uh, doing 3D models and laying out pipe uh, and, and building geometric models. But they say, when do I get to do pipe stress? When do I get to do fluid flow uh, and, and uh, you know, fluid flow networks and all this stuff I was trained for, heat transfer? And they never get into it. They, 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 they end up, you know, learning a little bit about piping and doing Doing some pipe routing maybe they work three to five years and then they take off they want i want to be an engineer what did i get trained for and so uh even the third world has a uh retention problem uh by the way they recruit they they, they use a prerequisite of engineering and those people want to use their engineering background uh, so and in the u.s we used to have a a, a tradition of, of technical schools two-year associate degrees uh CAD, you know, you take a CAD course and then you go to work and you get trained as a piper. Uh, you apply all your AutoCAD literacy and your uh, primitive math and science and you go to work. You're basically a draftsman with a lot of layered expertise. So, uh, no, we have a, we, it's, it's a big problem. I just finished a white paper. I wouldn't say finished. I just have a good draft, a showable draft of a of a, a couple of formats for uh, for uh, you know training uh, engineers and designers to enter the enter piping and uh, the pro the problem that uh, the way I think it's going to settle out, Sean. And I think we're going to get into. Uh, finishing schools you know a guy gets a degree and then he goes to a special you know compact course and whatever's hot you know maybe piping's hot that year automotive's hot or water and wastewater or you know wave action or you know something else whatever's hot that year he goes to a finishing school and it sets him up and it gets him all trained and then bam he gets presented to the market and i you know the industry itself has gotten very lazy. You know, they really want a guy who eight o'clock Monday morning can start earning money. And they think everybody, all getting there is the responsibility of government and the student. You know, they don't want to personally run a school anymore. So, uh, you know, okay, if, if you take that approach, then you're going to have to, you're going to have to set up programs like finishing schools to get people you know, introduced to the market. So the on ramp. This is what they're having to do in India. Now. On ramp, huh? So this is what they're having to do in India now. So in India, they're producing so many graduates that they have to have a, a postgraduate exam to see which of them essentially are of any value at all. So they have this exam called the GATE, G A T E exam. And essentially, that just takes a slice of the graduates from all the different engineering schools and says essentially, these are the ones worth employing. These other ones, not so much, yeah. And then they have the sort of thing that you're talking about. So essentially, some of the, some of the Indian businesses we're talking about because the business no longer trusts the output of the engineering schools in it. And several businesses were talking about starting their own university in which they taught practical engineering. And what you see a great deal of is courses intended to take the very impractical output of Indian universities, engineering degrees, and, and give them practical skills. But whenever, whenever I look at them, I look at the people delivering these courses. People delivering these courses don't have any practical experience themselves. Um, these courses are all actually about how to work ISIS or or something of that nature, which most students have already learned at university. So, so yeah, so uh, a lot of chemical engineering graduates in in India are actually ending up in in IT. Now, I, I have a message from from Catherine, uh, which is a, a ready to start when you are. Uh, if, 
with oh, 12 oh, minutes oh. in. So I'll, yeah, I'm glad to discuss these and, and indeed other issues with you, uh, Agent Bill. Um, so I'll fire up my presentation. Um, can you all see that? Okay, I can see that. So I don't know if you can all also see the meeting chat box. I will be using that later. Um, so, so, well, when I ask questions, uh, if, if you can type the answer into the box rather than like, everyone speaking at once, I think they've only got maybe a dozen people, but um, uh, all the same, 12 people speaking at once is, is a Um So I'll make a start, I guess. Right, so I'm going to talk about two books that I've written. Uh, so what, what is the plant layout book? Or getting some assistance with, getting some assistance with the, the dictionary. So I, I wrote a dictionary, processing the elements of the their terminology, and also my updated classic book from the 80s uh, on, on flat layouts. Um, that's it. Ah, that's it. So I, I'm a, a, a chemical engineer, a process engineer. <coughs> started out with EPC companies, actually started out in proposals, started designing lots and lots and lots of plants, sometimes several at the same time, uh, because there are always bits to write, and that's what I get with it. Design and build bids. So I have to process design, I have to do the layout. It, essentially, I've got an electrical engineer to help me with the electric software and the rest of it, basically, to work it up myself sufficiently well to write a bit. So um, that was excellent experience. I got a lot of experience very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't, I didn't spend that long, however, working for a bit of three months for well, quite a while. Um, and, I, I did do five years as an academic, kept my business going on the side, which was just as well, but I didn't really like academic uh, part of the committees. That's where the other part of the committee is. It's not really my sort of uh, so I am a plant designer, process plant designer, also a commissioning engineer. Nowadays, a lot of what I do is finding fault with what other people are. I'm a troubleshooter, I'm an expert witness. Uh, if things have gone wrong. People want to know what went wrong, quite often whose fault it is, and who's going to get paid in the case where I'm employed by an insurance company, uh, and uh, yeah, essentially investigate what there is on site, I look at design, I look at how it was operated, etc. Sometimes it's, um, it is a, a layout problem, uh, one of the things come on to that in a moment. So what I do now, largely nowadays, is either expert witness work or, or um, insurance work. Not really sure whether they should call. I also write some books. Uh, four books uh, today, these four, one of which, first of all, I think, in the first. Uh, another is the Dictionary of Chemical Engineering. So, we discussed briefly the lack of on to I think, layout engineering um, and whether, whether that is a dying art. In fact, I wrote an article in the um, book. <clears throat> One of the reasons why UK universities were no longer teaching layout is there was no longer an up-to-date textbook. There had been a good textbook, a number of good textbooks back in the 80s, a lot of high updated. Mecklenburg was, was uh, considered a classic in the UK. I think it was quite widely used worldwide. Um, I'm also a big fan of Bowsbacker and Hunt, but again, it's all, all hand-drawn sketches. I mean, I am from the era of, of hand-drawing. I've got a drawing board still behind me, although I don't do a lot of hand-drafting. Um, but um, modern students look at that, and it's obviously from the olden days, uh, as, as people <laughs> in the uh, era when I went to university. Um, so what was needed if universities were going to teach layout was a textbook which brought practical uh, layout uh, into universities in a way that academics could understand in a format that they could use with sort of step-by-step -step guidance on how they could go about laying plants out. Um, it isn't that students weren't being asked to lay out plants. All engineering degrees worldwide. In the final year, there's always a large whole plant uh, design project. And one of the things that the students do is lay the equipment out in space. However, they've just been throwing it down. You know, they've had no methodology, no understanding. The people teaching them have no methodology or understanding either. Uh, and consequently, they were doing it. But it wasn't actually taught. Um, so I was teaching this. Uh, I produced a book, my own use and for the use of others. So this is actually my most popular book that I could do anything. Uh, so there was a certain amount of success with that. I, I hadn't uh, actually had heard about the book until I taught. Um, it so happened that I was occupying the same office and the same role. Uh, as the person who wrote the book back in the 80s. So somebody there gave it to me to see that it would be useful if it was updated. Um, so I decided to update it, which I came to regret um, because it was two solid man years of work, even though I had something to start with. So I basically just took a Stanley knife to the, uh, the book I had and ran it through a modern photocopier, which spat out a PDF uh, of, of the content of the book, uh, an editable PDF. And that's 
where I started. Uh, at this point, I've been an engineer for about 25 years. I'd, I'd written another book previously, so I had an idea of the process of writing a book. And my main asset was I had probably at that point 10,000 followers on me. I had a very large pool of people uh, who I could ask to help me. None of them would have to do too much on their own, although some people did, did a great deal, but, but I had a lot of people to help. And there was a lot of women. A few key questions. There are a few key things that people disagree with. Uh, things like how many stages there are to, to the design of a plant and, and what those stages are. The survey might be survey, answers back uh, ranging from three to ten. Uh, but it became clear that really they were talking about the same thing. Uh, and uh, so the thing I wanted the book to be is correct, complete. I wanted to update it. I wanted it to uh, The original book was written by therefore the chapters repeated each other, contradicted each other, and taken as a whole, there were big gaps. So for example, there wasn't a single mention of steam anywhere in uh, and quite a lot of other utilities, no mention at all. Classic chemical engineer focus on the main process the uh, and, and no real thought about the off and i think even calling them off is part of what tends to make chemical engineers a bit blind because they're off-site they're outside battery limits uh, people aren't considering so there were quite a few other gaps but that that was the most obvious gap so the way i do things essentially is i write drafts of everything and then i circulate them split it into small so i'm not asking any individual person to do too much send them out to each one of these to maybe 10 people so 200 people helping me, and each thing gets sent out to 10 people, of whom seven say, uh, very nice, or nothing at all. Uh, but there's always a few who, who offer useful, detailed comment, uh, which I then consider, uh, mostly incorporate, summarise, sometimes leave out, disagree with my book. So uh, if, I, if I greatly disagree, then I will simply leave. So what had changed since the 1980s? Well, I've, I've been around in the 90s, uh, so I have some idea of what changed. Um, so obviously, when I first started at work, we had one computer between 15 of us, and you had to book time. Uh, and um, now everyone's got a computer. I've, I've got something more powerful than a computer in that pocket. Um, powerful more computers we have back then. Anyway. However, these new computers don't actually do anything that they didn't do in the 1980s. We just do it much quicker. Um, so uh, Mecklenburg, who wrote the original plant layout book, when he describes what he was getting computers to do back in the 1980s, not that different from what modern um, packages can do. It's just that he has to send them back. Paul, Sean, what meant by the word speciation? What is that? Speciation. I will come on to that. Okay. So, okay. so what, what's happened with computers is that um, essentially they have made communication and international communication very easy. And therefore, in-house versus outsourced design, it made it very easy to outsource design to places where it's cheap. Uh, and this has had a massive impact on. Um, also, there are now architects who specialize in laying out process plants, which I didn't know about until I started uh, writing the book, uh, very commonly in uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And they have a different methodology. <laughs> and then, of course, there are the traditional. So speciation is to do with, uh, so it's a term from biology, it's, it's to do with how a population of organisms gets separated. Uh, let's say they're, they're either side of a chain of mountains. So they all started out the same, but over time, they change. Okay. Two populations on either side of the mountain become different species. And this in biology is called speciation. And a similar design method on And it's the way pipers do it, and the way process architects do it. And um, even within pipers, there are schools of thought, and there are different approaches. Uh, so there's been a bit of speciation. Uh, so I think I have seven different methodologies at the back of the book. Uh, and uh, layout is, I'm not really aware, I wasn't aware of anywhere in the UK teaching layout at the point where I wrote the book. It simply wasn't taught to chemical engineers at all. It was, it was, it was a non-issue for us. Uh, the other thing is, there was, there is a kind of academic research going into layout. However, it isn't actually of any practical whatsoever. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's an exercise in, in mathematics and in order to make it possible to address it mathematically, they have to simplify the problem to the point at which it bears no resemblance to the original problem. So, so the academics with most powerful computers in the world and roomfuls of people with PhDs can have a go at laying out plan on a single floor. Yeah? So, so, so the, the, any, anything above that single plane is beyond them and their product is 
is inferior still to that of anyone with any experience in it. It's not. It's not the kind of thing computers can do. So, so Pipers shouldn't be worried that chat GPT is going to be taking over their job anytime soon. Um, computers are not books. Uh, I think Bill has sent me some examples of ways in which computers playing out plans of uh, falling short and uh, and the necessity to check it. So those are the things that have changed. Uh, and uh, obviously my academic colleagues insisted that everything would change. Uh, well, most things. The nature of the design process was the same as it ever was. Yes, we used some programs to do things and perhaps we... You know, we've got a 3D scan of it and that all goes into a, a BIM system and so on. But an engineer still has to look at an engineer still has to consider it. Um, the, these things are helping us, but drawings are still way more important than mathematics. Uh, and there's a lot more to design. Uh, a layout, just as important as it ever was. This is uh, taken from a scientific paper. Um, these are the design errors resulting in accidents on process plan. As it shows, the number one cause, the number one design fail causing process plan accident, bad layout. Well, layout um, are you are you including pipe routing in when you say layout in this in this design area? Are you thinking so, pipe so routing as well? I believe so. I can send you the original paper if you wish and you can judge for yourself because it wasn't my paper. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So that you, you know, traditionally, uh, you know, people consider equipment layout different from piping layout. No, so, you know, in the book I cover for me, it's sort of nested, uh, and you can go in into out or out to in. People go one way, then they go the other, backwards and forwards. But essentially, there's sort of gross whole site layout. I guess there's site selection, then there's site layout. Within site layout, there's plot layout. Within the plot, there's equipment layout. <laughs> And then that's all piped up. Okay. But then you have to go back out, don't you? You have, you have to consider how it all works as a unified whole. So for me, yeah. layout is all of it. The, the, okay. the book is, is all of that. And it's it's also not just the main process pipe work, the utilities. It's, it's the flows of people as well as the flows of uh, fluids. Uh, all has to be considered part of the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I mean, I wasn't... The original version of this presentation being delivered to chemical engineers had a lot more information about layouts, but I wouldn't presume to tell you guys anything about it. <laughs> um, so, so the picture is actually, it's a water feature uh, that I did the, I, did I design it. So an architect designed what he wanted it to do, uh, and I had to figure out how to make it do that. And it's uh, about 100 metres long, the, the thing you can see a picture of there, and uh, there are plant rooms hidden underneath it that actually make it do all the stuff it does. It's at Anik Castle, where they filmed Harry Potter in the grounds of Anik Castle. Mm -hmm. but anyway, so what was new? Well, the definition of terms is an issue I'm going to come back to later. So what I found when I did the survey of various people was that a lot of the misunderstandings and disagreements between people were because they were using the same term to mean different things and different terms to mean the same things. But once you got everybody to use the same terms in a consistent way, it, it turned out they didn't actually disagree at all. Um, but then you had the people who insist that their terms are the only correct one. Uh, and that's how I ended up writing a, a dictionary about that's for later. So lots of new pictures. Uh, didn't get as many as I wanted. The hardest thing when writing a book to get are the illustrations. Well, getting the illustrations, getting permission for the illustration is often the most onerous part. I did case studies to illustrate the point tech and various other things. Essentially, it was book data again. It's making it bigger. But what I didn't have time for was getting rid of all of the old, getting the replacements for all of the old half 1980s uh, pictures of various bits of plants, some of which are pretty old. Uh, I don't think any of these are so old that I, I don't still see things like them. But when people see illustrations like this, it makes it look like an old thing. It makes it look like it still belongs to you. So I'm going to be looking to get in my next pass. I'm going to be looking to get replacements for these. But I was more interested, actually, in getting new stuff, so outputs from uh, various software packages, simulation packages, things of that nature. And, uh, I replaced as much of the old stuff as, as it was time for, but two years of long ago, do it as the next page. I'm now for So the publisher actually wanted me to update the book. It have sold quite well. This is by academic standard. I think selling 500 copies ever is considered to be fabulously successful. It's a fair bit better. And at their prices, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> That's the dead price of it. Pretty high. Um, so I just spent three years writing the dictionary. <laughs> so 
I'm I was not the ob- I was laughing at the obnoxious reviews from academics. <laughs> yes. So anyway, the publisher asked, asked me to uh, update it, and um, so uh, and, and even though it was their idea, they sent it all out for peer review. And uh, I don't know who this person was because they were uh, anonymous, but um, you know, it was absolutely scathing. Oh, he says nothing about the research, the research, you know, and and, uh, and it's nearing the end of his career. And I thought, I'm not even sixty. I mean, I'm ended, nearing the end of my career. <laughs> I don't, I don't intend to end my career. I, it was, uh, yeah, it was very rude indeed. I thought, well, it, you know, n- now I'm absolutely going to have to publish this book just, just to piss this guy off. Uh, so, uh, but what he did, he did, he was so insistent that the research was was no longer used uh, that I went and contacted all the most highly cited papers in this academic field uh, attempt to do something approximating like and asked them if, if he was right that, that, that this approach was finally yielding something that anybody had ever used in the real world. And I said, no, no, we haven't, you know. So I will not be uh, rowing back on the, on the old approach or um, putting something in the new book about how things are different and, you know, the academics have finally figured out a way to automate layout and make us all redundant. Um, yeah, there, there's nothing to worry about there for the foreseeable future. Um, so, new graphics, Bill has offered some interesting additional um, material, which uh, may well take him up on. I am open to other suggestions or things that should be there, things that should be there to make the book, to make it a complete account of, of the practical business of of, of laying things out in space. So Bill was talking at the start about the uh, you know, sort of highest level course, which got a lot of things about management. So I wouldn't, wouldn't be looking to sort of put that in. It's, it's more the nitty gritty, laying it out in space, the interactions between the various engineers uh, who, who design, review, making sure that it's, it's well thought out from the point of view of, of all disciplines, making sure that it's safe, that, that people are properly considered what's going to happen if there are incident uh, things of that nature. So very, very much on the technical side rather than the, the management side, because I, I've essentially spent a, my entire career looking at management, and I have well, no intent of uh, changing that. Uh, so, but when it comes to the nitty gritty of like way in which it's done, somebody's got a methodology other than the seven that I've included. Very. So during the course of writing that, uh, it became clear to me that engineers are often talking across careers, especially if they get a bit emotional as, as we sometimes do uh at friction i mean it's necessary friction but it's also unnecessary uh and um seemed worthwhile to write a dictionary of, of chemical engineering practice so i've been finding this all the way along that, that talked to lots of engineers about these various subjects and it was clear that actually things but words are not often what engineers are good at. Engineers are often good at maths. Uh some of them are good at seeing things in space. Uh those who are good with words tend to be the minority um and and one of the misunderstandings is that essentially words have a single meaning um, and and the way in which you use words is the correct one and if somebody uses it in a different way um no well, it's the simplest thing that's simply uh expensive uh-huh. miscommunication so i thought when i originally did this i did not think people were going to say right and i was going to have to write ten thousand definitions this was not my plan at all i had a really lazy plan for writing this dictionary i thought what i'd do is i'd ask them nicely if i could use they're different. And um, the answer was sure, but we're going to want about a thousand dollars for every single one. So um, the amount of money that Elsevier paid me to write a book would not have covered uh, the ten million pounds, ten million dollars. But that actually worked out fun because once I stopped being lazy and I had a look at the things, many of them had the hallmarks of being given by a uh, So, so it's a bit like those those meetings where you get a lot of sort of senior managers in the room. They all want to feel that they've contributed to something, mm-hmm. and and you end up with, with not quite sure if this idiom is going to uh, make sense to the Canadian audience. But it's what we call a dog's breath. Uh, you, you end up with something that's made of scraps, stirred with a stick, and um, it's a mess. It's not It's not a design. It's, it's got a little bit of what everybody wanted in there, and nobody has had the guts to go, no, nah, that, that be better if we left that out. better if we made things simpler. Anyway, so tiresome as it was to have to write all these definitions, um, I, I, I am much happy with the definitions that I wrote. Than, than the ones that I was going to use. Uh, and the good news was uh, I had Tango Mac because I was in Panama and uh, there was this COVID thing and uh, Panama closed its borders. I was stuck in the rainforest living in a shipping container uh, and 
I had nothing else to do. Rough draft of the book uh, was written living in a shipping container in, in the Panamanian for, uh, jungle. Uh, what I was supposed to be doing there is, uh, is in the, the bottom right-hand corner illustrate the, uh, the plant I designed while I was there. It's uh, an effluent treatment plant made out of what was available, which were shipping containers. So we threw down a slab and we made a plant out of shipping containers and various things that were liners. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but I, I think I achieved a, quite a tidy layout considering the. Uh, um, but once that was done, emergency flight back home by Mexico, uh, where nobody really seemed to care about COVID, um, but even wearing masks. Um, so, um, so I've, I've made a good start in it by that point. Um, Steve, next one. So, here's a bit of audience participation. Here are a number of terms which are in my dictionary, which were problematic in various different ways. So, <laughs> hopefully, we can also. First one is jogs. Can you define the word jog? So I'll give you a clue. It's, it's most commonly used in the oil and gas sector, as you're used to working in that area. So I find the oil and gas sector are often the sector who are most insistent that their version of a word is the only correct one. The difficulty with dogs is they don't even agree with themselves, their meaning of the, uh, of the term is. Any offers? Nobody's come across the term before? Ah, well, yeah. I didn't include that. There's a reason why I didn't include that, because it's a technical dictionary and therefore it only includes professional terminology rather than everyday meaning of words. Yes, thank you, Islam. Uh, so here's what it means in the oil and gas. Industry. So it's, it's one of those seven things. So you can see how even when people do what they consider to be a technical term applicable in a very narrow area, so this essentially, the vast majority of these meanings come from drilling, oil and gas drilling. And I, I got most of them out of lots of drillers. So I, I basically recruited through LinkedIn. And yes, they, they didn't agree with each other about what these things were. The general idea is dogs are things that grip them. Uh, but it's a wide range of things that groups. So I'm going to remind myself now of what the, uh, the second term was. Risk. Is there, I mean, I'm guessing you've all had the term used many times. Any offers as to what risk is? The word that people throw around in engineering circles and, uh, all the time. So Max has given us an offer. Certainly one of the, um, yeah, quite right. So ISO alone in their standards offer more than 40 definitions. ISO do not agree with themselves about what risk means. And of course, there are people other than ISO. So similarly to the offers which people have made, uh, it's something to do, usually to do with the probability of something bad happening. Uh, sometimes people say that it's that multiplied by the severity of the outcome if this occurs. They, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen the, uh, the matrix that uh, takes probability and multiplies it by uh, severity of outcome, uh, contentious in some circles. However, um, ISO offer a wide range of definitions. Um, as you can see, between those definitions, they, they really don't even agree on things about whether um, it's about something bad happening. Um, so generally speaking, you have to be very careful uh, to make sure that you are using terms in the same way as other people. And then we get into <laughs> then we get into another area with sustainability. Again, it's a word that's thrown about a lot. Any offers? Say, this is what we call a highly contested term sustainability. So it, it's quite politicized and it's, it's highly contested. There's a lot of disagreement about what it means. Often that disagreement is, is linked to a political view. People tend to be split a lot, political lines as to what the term sustainability is all about. So you can see the quote from the US EPA. Uh, it draws our attention to the existence of problems and does little to tell us the origin of those problems and nothing about how to solve. Not a particularly useful concept, especially since there's so much politically based disagreement about what it means. So the next one, I think there's a reasonable chance that there's someone here is going to correct my pronunciation. The next one is, I believe, pronounced Schupentute. Happy to be contradicted. It's a Dutch word, so I'm guessing Catherine can probably pronounce it best than me. Never heard of it. Again, it is from, well, that's a Schupentute. It is a sort of inlet baffle. It's an inlet flow control device invented by Shell, which is why it's got a Dutch name, which I think means ship's horn. It's sort of horn shape. Um, just a nice word, but incredibly specialised. If you've not done anything like that, you'd have no idea of the word. So the last one is tannoy. Does anybody know what a tannoy is? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether this is uh, internationally used. Is tannoy a word that's... Yeah, I'll say. So it's a, it's a public address loudspeaker. And this is an example of, of, of what's called a genericised trademark. Or a, or a bus proprietary eponym. Uh, so like a Hoover, uh, it's where something's a brand name and it becomes the word for the thing. Except Tannoy hate this, but basically sue anybody who uses the word Tannoy or any public address loudspeaker that they didn't. Um, so I can't remember if I've got a little trademark uh, 
thing that is in the book. Uh, but Tannoy is not a generic public address live speaker, even though we all use the word in that sense, uh, unless it was made by Tannoy. Um, so what am I looking for? What's my payoff for, for having talked to you today? So what I'm hoping for is I'm hoping for new people who are willing to assist me with reviewing the, the, the third edition of the book. Very much hoping for new graphics, modern graphics, to replace some of the old ones. Anyone who has the time or already has written content that they feel would, would be a useful addition, uh, very welcome. Or if people don't have the time and don't have it, but they have an idea for something, I am very happy to write it myself. Um, so that's that's... So that's about the plant layout book. That, that's what I'm after. Obviously, you are, are, are the guys to see about this. Paul helped me last time, as well as uh, Richard, who I think has done some work with Paul in the back. Um, so do you have any questions for me? I was wondering, how long were you stuck in Panama? 12 weeks. 12 weeks? Yeah. Uh, there was an outbreak on the site, uh, and, and it wasn't just the country was closed. The fence around the site was closed. We were not allowed to leave the site. Uh, it was, uh, And people, people were dying um, because I think they had sort of eight respirators for the whole country in Panama. Mm. Uh, it was not a place that you wanted to get COVID early in the uh, pandemic because uh, they were they were not at all well prepared. Well, I mean, I got to go walking in the rainforest every day on my own. Um, and uh, yeah, and I got to make a start on the uh, the dictionary. So uh, every cloud has a silver line. John, when is your book uh, going to be uh, go drafted? Let's say when do you what what timetable are you talking about? So I don't have uh, a signed contract at the moment. I am I am still. It's been a long negotiation with the uh, publisher, but I'm expecting to have a contract signed inside the next month or so, uh, and then it'll be two two years until the point at which I have to submit it. So I'm going to be proceeding in a fairly leisurely way. Might be looking for something in six months to a year something like that uh, i mean earlier is better um but um and then i spend a long time sort of polishing the product so i i, I tend to have it tends to make me half the time take about a year to produce a draft of the book and then the next year will be spent uh polishing that uh prior to giving it to the uh the publisher we uh, let, let me uh talk a little bit about uh, this process plant layout uh course that we offer uh it uh, really the history is uh, we used to teach as a master class uh, a a short course in Houston that actually had Boss Bacher as a, one of the lecturers. Okay, and many of the authors of his chapters would come and teach in the in the class because Boss Bacher lived in Houston. Boss Bacher and Hunt both lived in Houston, and so uh, it, traditionally we've had a long history of teaching. Uh, process plant layout with piping design, piping design in mind. Um, and then based on that course, I attended the course, uh, the course offering maybe three times. And then I wrote a series of slides from what I observed uh, that uh, I would say half the content was inspired by his book. And the other half was my own personal collection of photographs, plus some other ideas. And gradually over time, I included things like Jim Madden's methodology that he uh, he sent me a, uh, 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 or gave me a, uh, uh, a copy of his course notes that he used in London. Uh, and I, I use that example in, in, uh, in the layout course extensively. Um, but um, even today, we're, we're looking at uh, how much equipment layout has changed. There's at least two products now that automatically lay out equipment based on P&ID. Uh, uh, there's a big market for this developing, in my opinion. It, and it's, I think, um, I think it's going to change the way layout occurs. I think there'll be a lot of, okay. uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, pre-planning on the count of process engineers who know the process, know the unit equipment, and want to get a rough draft of the plant uh, for estimating purposes very quickly. There's also, um, and we haven't really considered that there is a, um, and I don't, I don't recall the names. I'm having a senior moment, but there's a large collection of statistical data as to what equipment costs, and people try to try to go out and estimate plants early. They estimate from a list of major equipment, then they do valve counts, and then they do, uh, you know, 
all kinds of estimating on a statistical basis. This is not what I call equipment layout. This is to get an estimate of the plant. But I see now also with, we have so many established plants, a lot of people go brownfield and they now lay out from scans. And then there's that whole question of uh, rectifying scans and uh, building a model and incorporate, you know, how much added value do you put in the model? These are all topics that we didn't cover in the beginning that now are obviously on the table. Okay. The whole world has changed on us about how equipment's layout, particularly for Brownfield. The whole world has changed. You know, you could, we could talk about how do you place, you know, space, orient, elevate, and separate equipment. And then somebody hands you a scan and say, here's where the, here's where the exchanger has, has to go. Okay. Yeah. You know, deal with it, you know, deal with it. Okay. So uh, the, the world's changed quite a bit under our feet. And uh, so we are facing this similar issue. How do we, how do we take SPED's layout ideas into the, uh, into this century and how much of that do we include in our courses? Uh, we, we're, we're thinking of, uh, and I've mentioned this previously, we're thinking of maybe having uh, maybe a, 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 a unit in our plan layout class uh, written by the two uh, equipment automator that we know of. There's, there's two uh, vendors already we know of. So who are they? Uh, What's uh, the name of those companies? Uh, well, Opti, they're, Plant, Opti Plant, I think, was one. Right. And, and uh, there's, uh, one, there's one by Bentley. Uh, I can't recall off the top okay, of my head. Okay, so Bentley. I, I've got a contact at Bentley. So so okay. I know that so I know the Bentley product would do it. Um, but and Sean, didn't you uh, have an article recently on that? Or? So it, I, I, I did. Um, so, I mean, Bet Bentley were, were useful to get me. They gave me um, quite a bit of the uh, updated graphics that I used in my book I got from Bentley. Um, and um, so they, they were quite useful to me. And yet, the, the thing is with these products is that there's a lot of time involved uh, in getting set up. Once you set up, yes, they're, they're great, but, but setup time is still... So the Bentley product, for example, set, setup time is very uh, considerable. Um, once you set up, uh, it's a different matter, and, and, and it will, you know, they, they will do a lot of the, uh, the work for you. Uh, and eliminate a lot but but it still all requires checking by someone experienced uh and, and laying out equipment so you mentioned this part of equipment layout is let's say deciding whether to have gravity flow or, or have a pump uh and how are the pipes are going to be and what, what the velocities are going to be in the pipe so, so that process engineering part of um, of, of, of laying things out in space, um, got to put an awful lot of data in to get a, a yeah. model to make make sense of it. But but I mean, I may not be up to date. I, I haven't looked at these for a few years, and maybe maybe they're way better than they were last time. Well, uh, so well, we're, we're, we just passed we just passed the one hour mark. Um, oh. uh, should we keep going on? Uh, I know for some people it's. Well, so, I, I, I could talk about this all day, but um... yeah, no, I think I think what uh, I think. Uh, uh, we uh, the the sped board has to discuss. Uh, should we invite you to come in and do an overview or take a quick look at our play layout class and uh, as a, as a reviewer and uh, make a few notes about uh, what have we forgotten uh, and, uh, and what might inspire you. Uh, also, uh, I'm probably going to. Uh, try to go ahead with this seminar of automation, uh, you know, automated uh, layout. And uh, obviously you'll be invited uh, to attend. Uh, and and it'll, uh, we we actually did a short course for all the SPED board uh, with, uh, you know, uh, Aspen's product now. It used to be uh, uh, ASD, I think. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we, you know, we did a short course and we all took their <clears throat> preliminary awareness course, 10 hours of instruction, but it was convincing, okay? It was convincing that this is this will play a role. It'll play a role at least at the estimating stage. You know, when a process guy is trying to get a handle on what the major piping is going to cost, what the equipment's going to cost, it'll there's going to be a role for that. I don't know if it's going to be a final design. I don't think so. But uh, but I see. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the old problem. We used to all have secretaries that would type our letters, and then suddenly we type all our own letters. Okay, I think uh, 
there'll be a lot of uh, feed work that's done by process engineers before it's even you even show it to an engineering company. You know, this is the kind of plant we're looking at, and they they'll they won't depend on your work. They they accidentally might, but they but they're going to say, oh, you didn't think of this, you didn't think of prevailing winds. There's no sense of logistics. You know, where's the storage? You know, where does this fit in the existing plant? But the process engineers will do a lot of feed work before it even they present it for formal feed awareness. So they'll, they'll it'll be a gut feel uh, task. But that that's my, my main point is uh, I think what the SPET board should do is considering uh, giving you a guest uh, enrollment in our process plant layout class and let you list, you know, listen to a few videos, look at a few notes, as long as you understand that it's a courtesy, uh, you know, look around, uh, you know, uh, you, you, I, again, a lot of it was thinking, but we've changed, yep. you know, it's a lot of intro stuff, a lot of thinking that I've put into it and other people have put into it. Uh, and then, um, you know, then I think what we spent will also do is do a series of seminars that you can be a party to and a, an a, and attendee on that will be on missing pieces, scan rectification, uh, automation, uh how to, you know, what should a piper prepare to feed an autumn? Should a piper uh, understand to accept uh, third-party scanning data into a model? Uh, yeah. How much value would you add to a scan? You know, questions like that. You know, because, you know, uh, and, and what zones would you identify in a layout, you know, that would be used by an automated piper? The not over, the not under, uh, the, you know, here's the preferred routes. So a piper acts as a preferred route, you know. What what are the preferred route zones? Things like that, and I'm using term I'm throwing terminology out like it's like I use it every day, like everybody's using it. But but you end up inventing a lot of terminology. Your idea of of trying to get a consistent glossary going is uh, definitely uh, uh, one of the outcomes of your book is yeah. going to be a consistent glossary, a glossary with a context. You know, I'm here's how the the term is used. Uh, you know, so um, and then. Um, but there's also the practical limitations. You know, you could write, I mean, we have 23 hours of recording talking about layout. Well, that can't be a book. You know, Bosbacher and Hunt's book alone, you know, uh, has so many pages. And, and I don't think you're trying to compete with Bosbacher and Hunt. I think you're trying to take a bigger view. So, but, I mean, Bosbacher and Hunt, I, I feel I'll freely admit um, the bits of Bowsbacker and Hunt that I liked, I put in. Uh, especially, yeah. I, I didn't copy it word for word, but uh, or, or, or take any of their illustrations. But um, and the stuff that you're talking about, that that sounds invaluable. That that sounds. I mean, I, I'll be delivering to if. if I incorporate any any of the things you're talking about. I'll be delivering to the publisher more than I'm promising, but um, they never complain. Yeah, um, you, you, some you of the parts. Able... Some of the parts I I may write for you. Uh, you you said something about if you write it, I've got to rewrite it, or I have to I have to read it and write it from from the written because you prefer to get it in your own brain and get it well, out of the page from your writing. brain. Essentially, the problem with the original book is that it was written in seventeen different voices. Um, <laughs> Uh, I like it to be all the same, all the way through. Uh, so I rewrite it, and then my wife rewrites all of that, uh, so that so that my inconsistencies in tone are... Because if you write a big book, I mean, this book will probably... The third edition will probably have a 1,000 pages. So right. getting that to be completely even and consistent all the way through uh, is, is what the second year is largely spent doing, uh, just making it all like a single unified thing rather than... A collection of things, which you know, so many books written by academics. The the academic is the editor, and they get thirty five people to write a chapter, and uh, it's uh, some things are covered twice, some things are covered not at all. They all disagree with each other. You, you come away unsure, really, of um, what it is that, that you're being told sometimes in key areas. And I, I like to eliminate some factor. The yeah. other the other thing is there's another dimension, and Paul can. Uh, comment on this, but Bauer, B Bowers and Beale book on uh, on uh, plant design was heavily emphasizing uh, work packages, contract, uh, you know, uh, uh, I want to say staging or flow from stage to stage. It was very detailed on on uh, on uh, work content. You know, like what would you give to a a feed engineer? What would you get from him, and what would you give to the next step? You know, very. 
very detailed discussion of you know what are the what are the formal list of documents that you would want as an outcome of a piece of work. And uh, and so there is a flavor there in terms of equipment layout. Most people say, you know, I, oh, I, I want somebody to do the layout. Well, what do you ask for? What do you want in return for the layout? Do you want a, yeah. do you want a, a, a 3D model? Uh, do you want a list of equipment? Do you want a, uh, uh, you know, a, an annotated uh, uh, valve list? Do you want uh, a pro a line list? Do you want you know? I mean, you ask yeah. for these things, and you and you have to be very detailed about what you ask for. So I had Richard uh, produce me uh, a summary of his methodology as as part of the second edition, uh, and I also have uh, a chapter on deliverables, what deliverables are expected at each stage of things. Okay. So I so I have you not seen a copy you of the book? me uh, some files to read. I don't know if you sent me the entire book, but you mm -hmm. sent me okay. some of the chapter files. Yeah. So, I, so I essentially, it's, it's, yeah. So, so yeah. Richard was very, very uh, helpful. This was Paul, um, uh, as, as far as that's concerned. Uh, so, I, th I think the thing to do is, well, just make sure you've seen seen the whole book because the things that you're talking about, a lot of them are in there already. Which is not to say it can't be improved, but some of the things you're talking about are not in there. Need to be in there. Uh, and need to be addressed. Certainly, it sounds like, although academia hasn't really made any progress it sounds like commerce may have made some progress. Yeah. well a lot of the notes that i wrote uh that i've added on scanning i i scripted them for recording so mm -hmm. i have written words that you can look at that could be the basis of uh of, of your re reinterpretation or whatever you want to do you know we can look at that as long as i get credited for it i don't i don't need any royalties but uh <laughs> like your comment like your comment tracking down the owners of all these uh well-worn diagrams and getting permissions that you know that's the you know that writing the book is 90 percent of the work and then the other 90 percent is tracking down all the copyright owners and getting their permission to use their stuff you know there's no free use when you're writing a for-profit book you know so no, there isn't. or no i'm sorry there's no fair use when you write a for-profit so, book so yeah so i know people do that, but the, the lawyers, the the lawyers at the uh, publishers, very nervous. So yeah. I, 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 and I'm, no, no, I, nobody wants to get there, especially not in America. Uh, so, uh, so yes, they're, they're very cautious about that. So I'm very cautious about that. Uh, but um, that you know, it's it's, it's what always whether they be three D drawings or three D models or, or whatever. Essentially, it's 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 all visuals. 